So I think about active learning, I think Pear shares is one example, very much as a neurobiologist. Um, and when we as experts go into a class, like I'm gonna teach a class that I've taught like five or six times before, we know what's coming, it's not a surprise to us. But the students are there for the first time. So neurobiologically, they need more processing time to understand what's going on in the room, what the goals are, than maybe we need. And so it's important to remember when you're teaching as an expert that the people sitting there are novices and that part of what's happening in their learning is them actually changing their brain, actually thinking about what they already know, making new connections with ideas, and making new connections synaptically um, if, it's, if those ideas that they're learning are going to last. Where do the oxygen atoms in that CO2 come from? When you're exhaling it, just before it comes out of your body as carbon dioxide. When we're presenting a new idea in class, it might seem really familiar to us as instructors, but for students, it's a, a new novel idea. And just giving them a chance to write for a minute and talk with a neighbor about it for a couple of minutes can give them just the processing time to uncover what they already know about that and even start to have questions bubble up that they might want to bring to you as an instructor. All right, really quickly, turn to your neighbor. What did you choose and why? If you think about using a think pair share, that's one way to give people a chance to stop, make a prediction, reflect. There's no job they're going to have where they're somehow not going to be asked to talk about biology with other people. So I tell them, in this class in intro biology, now is the time to start practicing, <laughs> right? When you're an undergrad, so that when you get to upper division classes, when you get to postgraduate school, you're very, very comfortable talking about biology with lots of different kinds of people, especially even people that you don't know. I teach classes that range from 20 students to 270 students, and I don't think there is ever a class session that I teach where I don't do at least a couple of pair discussions. Um, sometimes there are classical think-pair shares where people have time to write, and then they have time to talk, and then I hear out. Sometimes I'll just notice in my lecture, like, wow, I'm not sure if people are getting this, and I'll stop and say, just turn to your neighbor and see if this is making any sense. I'm going to ask you a quick question. Uh, from one glucose molecule, I need you to, we're going to go through one glucose molecule. How many carbon dioxides are going to get produced? Six. six. Okay, so talk with a neighbor because I heard three and I heard a lot of people didn't answer. Why would it be six? Really loud. By 30 seconds, why six carbon dioxides are going to come off? So I think think pair shares, you don't always have to do the thinking, the pairing, and the sharing. That's the optimal. But you can use it as a really quick and easy tool to let people check in um, or to just let people have a chance to think about what's going on. So let me bring us back together. So in the spirit of time, I'm going to give you some time to talk. We're not going to do reporting out because we have to get through. I think it's helpful to see all four of these in an hour. Like, it's easier to kind of compare them if you've seen them all four. So I want to get through all four of them for you in one 50-minute class. So I'm going to tell you what I notice here and the kinds of things I want to alert you to. There are lots of students who are eager to learn biology, but they may not be confident in their learning of biology. And giving them a chance to think, write out their ideas, and then verbally rehearse that, share that with one other person in the room, can give them the confidence they need to raise their hand and present their ideas to the whole class or ask a question. I mean, how many times have we been in a seminar thinking, oh, I have this great question, but maybe I missed something. Maybe they already addressed that. And if you just have a minute to check in with a neighbor and they say, well, wow, that's a great question, then that can give students, uh, just like uh, uh, people in lots of different settings, the confidence to bring their ideas forward to the group. Rachel. So when I introduce my students to think, pair, share, one of the really important things that I think I say to them is that for some people, talking with a neighbor in class is going to be very much in their comfort zone. They're extroverts. They're going to like talking about biology with other people. For other people in the class, they may be way out of their comfort zone when I ask them to talk to someone else. And just acknowledging that, that for some people, this is going to be a hard thing to do and that uh, you appreciate them going out on a limb and getting out of their comfort zone and reassuring them that the reason that we're doing it is to try and promote their learning and to try and help them be the best professional in the biological sciences they can be. It's usually something that increases the receptivity uh, of students to being asked to do something that they may not normally be used to doing in a science class. Please talk to your colleagues. You can do it, Kevin. Go talk to it, Kayla. And don't exclude that lovely person who's smiling over there. 
what instructors are usually doing is looking around the room, seeing who's talking and not talking, maybe eavesdropping in on conversation. That's, that's really, really valuable to do. And oftentimes, if you see students who aren't in pair discussions with someone else, all you need to do is to go over. I usually kneel down and say, hey, could you turn and talk to your neighbor about that? I think you probably have really great ideas to share, and I know that they would appreciate you joining the conversation. Do you talk to somebody about this? Yeah. Explain, explain, explain B to these guys. Can you include this guy in your conversation? Because even people who really got this, they goofed on B. All right? Scooch over, move a coat. Whose coat is that? You can't always get everyone in a classroom doing a pair share. Um, so when I look out in a pair share, there are always certain students that maybe are not quite engaged. And sometimes all it takes is that sort of personal reaching out and encouragement to really get a super shy student into a group. So when you're first starting out with Think Pair Shares, uh, you just want to come up with a question, and hopefully a question that you haven't really addressed in class, that you give students uh, to consider, think about what they already know, and talk to a neighbor. Now, when you, after you have them write or think about it for a minute and you start to have them discuss, one of the key things to listen for is the noise. So if the noise in the classroom gets really loud, that's usually a sign that students are really engaged. It's a, it's a very provocative question. Um, the people in the pairs have lots of things to say about it. Sometimes you'll ask a question where people don't have that much to say, um, or they maybe don't quite understand the question. And so if that happens and the noise comes right back down, you might want to intervene, ask if you need to clarify the question, or you might just want to move on. When the noise gets really high and students are talking and talking, you have to interrupt them to bring them back together. That's when you know you've asked a really great pair share question, and you're going to have a lot of people interested to share and interested to hear what you think about it as an instructor. All right. I'm hearing the noise crash out. So when I hear the noise go down, and especially if I hear like, oh, did you see that movie? And the noise goes up, then I know it's time to go on. So we're going to go on. I had a colleague who said, oh, Kimberly, I don't understand. When you do a pair share, it gets really loud in here. When I do a pair share, they stay kind of quiet. And why is that? And I had to tell her I had no idea. But we worked together over the course of the semester. And what she noticed was whenever I did a pair share, I would actually tell them, it should get really loud in here for two minutes. Why would it be six really loud by 30 seconds? Why six carbon dioxides are going to come off? So really loud. Can you fill in any of those questions right now with a buddy for the first, first row of glycolysis? One minute, really loud. And so I had to get really loud. What were your predictions? And I want predictions for each one of those students really loud. So you got four things to talk about, maybe a minute and a half. So think pair shares aren't only for classroom situations. Think pair shares are for any situation where you want to give other people a chance to stop and think and make a prediction or have a sort of an idea of their own before you give them information. Uh, I've used a think pair share in a research seminar uh, to to great extent, so people were very engaged. They were very willing to kind of grapple with a question and try and make a prediction about how students might be thinking about something before I actually showed them the raw data from how students were thinking. So I think as scientists, we want to think beyond our classrooms. Strategies like Think, Pair, Share are just about uh, trying to give people the synaptic processing time to think about new ideas, regardless of whether or not you're an undergraduate or you're a Nobel Prize winning scientist.